Healthy Radio Show. I have my regular cast of characters here. First is Dr. Fred Gertz. Dr. Fred, glad to have you here. Good to be here. And certified financial planner, professional David Rudy and Ryan Repko that work with me at Rudy Wealth Management. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Dave, you're also a retired income certified professional. Is that what that's I like? honestly, I gotta forget. I think that's what it was. I think so, too. Uh, you can call in with your questions at 217-356-9397 or text us on the Castle Heating and Cooling text line at 3515357. You can also email us your question at talk at wdws.com. We also want to welcome those tuning in on Facebook Live. It's important to recognize that past performance is not an indication of future results. You should not make any investment decisions without first consulting your own financial advisor, conducting your own research and due diligence. Again, we're here just to, as I always put it or frequently put it, uh, just to kind of give you the information so that you can ask better questions from your financial advisor. And it's probably a good idea for most people to have a financial advisor, I think. But again, it's like uh, <laughs> asking a barber if you, need, if you need a haircut. Well, Fred, it, is this the Goldilocks economy that we have here? Not too hot, not too cool, uh, no recession really right around the corner, no boom right around the corner? Or is this what some people well, actually favor this type of environment? I'm not sure it's exactly the <laughs> Goldilocks. It certainly uh, seems all right right now. Uh, I, I just uh, uh, wrote something with the Flash Index re re released uh, last week saying that we're not in a recession and that uh, a slowdown is not the same as a recession. But I think there's more concern now than there has been. And for some reason, uh, I mean, for a number of reasons, uh, people are becoming more concerned about the international trade situation. It's been going on now for over two years, but some things are starting to hit home in terms of uh, agriculture, exports, things of that sort. So I think there's a little more concern there. The other uh, problem is last week there was uh, slow uh, employment growth, but the problem is, or the good thing is that there's so uh, few people unemployed now that you can't draw a whole lot of people back into right. the uh, workforce. So uh, that suggests there may be a, a slowing of the economy, but that's a long ways away from a recession. And it's a lot different than a recession, obviously, yeah. uh, has different implications. Of course, everybody was got all excited in the past month because, uh, you know, f f and I wouldn't say for the first time because there's been people, depending on where you look on the yield curve, but it's pretty much was, you know, accepted that the yield curve uh, finally inverted in August, which just means that the shorter term mm -hmm. interest rates are higher than longer term interest rates. And that's unusual. Normally, yeah. Uh, you have higher long-term interest rates and short-term rates, frankly, because if you're going to invest your money and tie it up for longer periods of time, you expect a higher rate of return. But it still seems to me for all the ranting and tweeting and uh, kind of dumb opinion pieces out there, uh, the economy really is kind of sort of just right with no recession, recession right. around the corner. Of course, the, we'll probably start one tomorrow so that everybody, can, or today, so right. that everybody can point to it started today. But I look at unemployment reached a 50-year low in April. Retail sales grew at 1.6%, all-time high. Uh, there's a couple other things I want to talk about, too. Uh, uh, macro growth drives corporate revenues uh, the way I see it. So, I mean, profit expansion just seems to, you know, uh, it also drives that profit expansion and valuation levels. Those seem reasonable to me. I, maybe it's this wild card of this, are we going to get more escalation in this trade war? Right. Um, there's also uh, I mean, clearly a... <clears throat> a slowing of the economy in uh, Europe and China, which may have an impact as well. Yeah, and uh, but one of the things I thought was interesting, because it seems like we're always fighting the last war as investors, and maybe as the financial media. Yeah. But when you, you know, if people may recall, the last Great Recession kind of kicked off with overinflated housing prices. Right. That's kind of the consensus. And it, you could make a pretty strong case mm -hmm. that, Housing prices really got ahead of themselves, probably for the right reason, because basically we had policies that rewarded home ownership, favorable tax treatment, et cetera. But I read an article uh, about the tappable equity, which means how much equity homeowners have in America, is now at an all-time high of $6.3 trillion, and approximately 45 million homeowners with mortgages have an average of $140,000 in tappable equity. I don't know why they call it tappable equity because it's, I guess you could go refinance and get to it. Uh, the delinquency rate in July was 3.46%, the lowest of any July on record dating back to 2000. Uh, I think that bodes well that says this, you know, you've, yeah. you've been real good about saying, look, it, 
doesn't have to be a complete financial meltdown crisis because that's the scars right. us from our past experience. Uh, it, you know, and, and nobody should say that that can't happen either, but it's a big difference between a slowdown or even a mild recession and a great recession. Right. I think the other uh, issue, which is, again, kind of looking for a problem, but um, we're in a situation now where uh, we don't have a lot of uh, ammunition uh, held back to deal with a recession because we're close to zero with interest rates and we're already running a trillion dollar deficit. So uh, that's what you might do in a, in a recession. We're already doing it. So there's probably less flexibility or less uh, a, a, a little bit less ability to deal with one. But again, uh, there's nothing like on, on the horizon, nothing like the uh, financial crisis that we had in 2007 to 2009. And if people remember, uh, everyone thinks about 2008 as the uh, as the crash, which it was, but there are lots of things going on prior to that. Uh, insolvency of a bank in uh, uh, UK, uh, lots of housing uh, foreclosures, uh, things of that sort of happening even before the, the crisis. And I was I read an article. Of, uh, actually, it was uh, Fed's 2016 survey of consumer finances. And so, and so what can we say about retirees financial security? Retirees themselves say it's go, it, say they're doing well in the 2018 th survey, the updated one. Only four percent of retirees say they they were finding it hard to get by. Seventy five percent of the retirees said they had at least enough money to maintain their pre-retirement standard of living versus 61% in 1992. So, you know, 75% versus 61%. So, uh, right. and, it, and the Congressional Budget Office data shows that since 1979, incomes from for retirees have risen dramatically faster than for working age households. So it seems yeah. like retirees are reasonably right. happy. And especially, uh, there's sort of now two groups of retirees uh, retirees are probably the people we're talking to here who have financial assets have done very well the last 10 years. As people long as they're not bonds and CDs, I guess. Well, even bonds, if well, you're in long-term bonds. Right. But even, but people who had most of their wealth in housing have just, uh, basically chugged along. And so again, uh, the, the wealth of, uh, of the lower half hasn't increased very much the wealth of the upper half a lot because of the financial assets going up in value. And it's certainly been a story, guys, of uh, the largest U.S. growth companies are having the much uh, much better returns than just about everything else. It reminds me back to the mid to late 1990s, not to the same degree and not to the same mania. Back then we had the dot-com bubble, but it was a period of time where a global portfolio of equities somewhat cap, you know, just kind of market weighted might have been clicking, you know, earning returns of 10 to 12 percent per year, but the Standard & Poor's 500 index earning 20 percent per year. That was five years in a row. But if you look at global portfolios, they're considerably, their returns are considerably below what you could have earned in the Standard & Poor's 500 index over the last five years. I don't know what to make of that. I don't make anything of it. Well, almost everything is, though, even uh, just small at, cap is doing as well as that. Yeah, so just about everywhere you run, uh, and that's led a lot of people, I think, to start asking and thinking. You know, I've seen it in, in some behavior, not necessarily from clients, but from other investment people. Well, they're suddenly wanting to pare down their small cap exposure because it's done so poorly relative to the S&P 500 index or international or value. And I try to remind these people that, look, you're looking at only the last 10 years. If you take a longer view approach, of course, financial people always say that, but that's our job is to think about what happens over a person's lifetime, a retirement lifetime that are measured in the periods of three decades now. Uh, but if you take a longer view, the, you know, we look back to the lost decade, um, it was the Standard & Poor's 500 index over that 10 year period actually lost 10% in total return. So a dollar would have been worth 90 cents and a globally uh, diversified equity portfolio might've been up somewhere around dollar would have been worth around a dollar 70. Again, these aren't, these aren't going to be exact numbers and I'm not trying to suggest that this is what you get next <clears throat> 10 years. I want to stay away from that. But, but if you look at the whole basically almost 20 year period now of the past two decades, you see, that the rewards for being a globally diversified investor were two or three percent a year greater. What I found most interesting, we I don't know if we talked about this last time, but if you look at the one year return, you know, over the last month or two. So if you go back 20 years, 
you've had a standard enforced 500 index return below 6% a year, Fred, and that's highly unusual. I, I, I don't know if there's anything to be made of it, but to put it in perspective, if we look at all the 20 year periods uh, and look at slicing and dicing on a monthly basis, so you get seven or eight, 900, seven, 800 of them, uh, and you look at those, all of them, only 5% of the 20 year periods had returns below 6%, and you had to go back to the late 20s, right. you know, and, and have invested in 1927 or 28 or 29 to end up with a 20 return below 6%. I don't know if there's anything to even be made of that other than now, fortunately, if you were a globally diversified investor, you earn closer to eight or 9% per Mm -hmm. year. So that is more in line with historical averages. Uh, I I just don't know what to make of that. I don't think there's anything to make of that other than. Well, that's the reason for diversification. You can't predict uh, uh, the future. So again, if you're diversified, you're always going to do worse than your best performing asset. But people I, wrestle with that, Fred. They yeah. really do because they like diversification when it's working. But uh, David Booth, the CEO of uh, Dimensional Fund Advisors, I just remember the one comment, and this is probably from 30 years ago. He said, well, diversification uh, works even when you wish it wouldn't. Yeah. And you, you take people right now that are looking at their broadly diversified portfolios of all these different asset classes, small companies, large companies, value companies, which are kind of the unexcellent uh, low price companies, growth companies. You look at, I mean, you look at this internationally emerging markets. Uh, they just, they don't like it when it's not behaving well, but as you said, it's, that's the deal with diversification. But why do you think people struggle with that? so much is it because when it plays out in real time and when diversification is working even when you wish it didn't is that just too much of a human uh problem no david and i think talked about this uh, a couple times ago that uh you're not necessarily unhappy if uh something bad doesn't happen to you for example you buy insurance you're not sad that your house didn't burn down you're happy that even though you paid for the insurance so again the the cost of diversification may be a slightly lower uh, performance than, than compared to the best performing asset, but yet you're getting that that insurance value under underneath it. You're paying a little bit for, it, but it's a, a good uh, a good deal in most cases. Well, and I think it really comes down to you don't know in advance what the best performing asset will be. It's just lately, I think the reason people are struggling is because the best performing asset has been basically the S and P 500 or the Dow Jones or you know just large the gro- large large growth companies and yeah those are the benchmarks that people look at so anyone who owns anything other than large growth companies lately is feeling kind of bad about their portfolio because it, it's not just been a subtle difference it's been a major difference so like if you look at actual small cap value stocks even just within the US so not not ignoring international we're still in the same country returns have been bad this year like I, i'm i know for a fact that small cap value is down substantially this year, year to date. Um, you compare that to an S&P 500 being up. So not only are you not up by as much in that particular, this is just Well, I'm not sure it's year to date. Assets. I think if you look year over year, that's the case. Or maybe one, it's sorry, year over year. one year performance, right. I think. I'm just thinking of numbers like that I've looked at recently, but I think it is, it's one year performance. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a wide difference. And I think, like I said, it's because they're looking lately. It's the benchmarks that you see on TV, right? Or you know, when you pull up your account at your custodian, and these are the benchmarks they're showing, and you're underperforming them by a fairly wide margin. If you're actually diversified, you're going to feel bad about it. But it's interesting that somebody would maintain a globally diversified strategy. It just says, "Look, I'm agnostic. I'm just going to own everything on the planet. I choose to own twelve or thirteen thousand stocks of every theme on the globe instead of five hundred stocks." in the U S um, it just seems like, you know, that that is not a, that sensible of approach itself. But then you hear somebody like Warren Buffett that says, you know, when he wakes up on a cloud, 90% of the money is going to go into a standard and force 500 index fund. So, you know, maybe that's why this is so difficult for investors to maintain that global diversification in real terms. Well, and I think at the end of the day, you need to ask yourself, is it a good idea to put all my money in one asset class? Or one country? Just like a common sense question, the answer is going to be no. Now, there's worse things that you could do than put all your money in the S&P 500, but at the end of the day, that is one asset class, and it's 
your portfolio in one asset class is going to have worse risk-adjusted returns than a globally diversified portfolio. And history has periods where we show that that is a horrible idea. Now we can go back to the 20s and 30s. If you were in the Russian or the German stock market, you got, you know, you were pretty much wiped out if you were just, you know, a German citizen investing in just the German. German. But then more recently, in modern times, let's call it, I, I remember because I've been in this business since the Dow was at 1,000. I remember for the first part of my career, so that would have been, you know, maybe the first 10 years of my career, the Japanese stock market, it, it didn't outperform by just a little bit. It outperformed it like why people were asking, why don't we own everything, anything but Japanese companies? And of course, the Japanese themselves asked themselves the same thing. And we all have our home bias. But that stock market is still considerably lower today than it was in 1989. Uh, these are reasons why you shouldn't have all of your money. I know this probably seems anti-American, Fred, when you say you shouldn't. Right. I don't believe that it's prudent to have 100%. I'm not saying it's reckless. I'm just saying I don't think that's the best strategy, the most sensible strategy to have 100% of your money in just one country by itself. The other thing is to uh, to change the benchmark. Uh, a benchmark should reflect how you're investing. Exactly. So it should be a, a blended be uh benchmark of all the different uh, assets. And then if you're doing worse than that, uh, something's wrong. If you're not, uh, you're where you hope to be. Right. But so what most people are doing is they're comparing apples and oranges. They're comparing but, a, a very diversified portfolio with totally different types of companies in it to a more concentrated portfolio with basically one type of company. But has the industry been hypocritical about this? Because at times when global diversification is doing better, just because it's doing better, Nobody forecasted it. Uh, I see a lot of, you know, people in the industry that will tote their how they've outperformed the benchmark and hire me because we've outperformed this S and P five hundred benchmark when they've had completely different. So it really cuts both ways. So maybe as an industry, we've te we've taught our uh, it taught investors to focus on this one asset class benchmark, but yet preach diversification, which means we're not going to put all our money in that one asset class. But Crow, when you're doing better than that, arbitrarily and make excuses when you're not. It, 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 and I think the industry itself, and I suppose in some ways I do it. You know, uh, I don't think to that extent uh, because I really don't fixate on a benchmark. Uh, I really fixate, and we're going to get into that <clears throat> next, really – if you have, and I guess this always backs up to financial planning and retirement planning. You know, we're, we're retirement planning uh, specialists, so that's all we think and breathe. But the whole point of having a retirement plan is that is what tells you what your allocation needs to be. And that allocation probably makes the most sense for it to be broadly diversified. And the real, the benchmark should ultimately be, am I okay? Not this arbitrary benchmark. And, and I would say this, if we, if a global portfolio was doing 5% better than the S&P 500, I promise you. And that's why it takes all this. I, th I think, guys, the reason that we have pretty much haven't even been questioned about the difference between a global performance and the standard ports 500 indexes, we've trained our clients to just basically ask, am I okay? Which is translation, is my plan still fine? Can I still have the standard of living, the financial independence, the financial dignity to do everything I want to do, hopefully, between now and when I wake up on a cloud? And that should be, the performance in most ways should be irrelevant. Now, if performance is, you get into a bad period of time. It's just a bad state of time. It's nothing particular about your portfolio. It's just general stock markets around the globe are down. That can have an impact on the plan and may cause for some modest adjustment. But that's what people should be relating to. I, I find people that fixate on the portfolio returns are people that don't have a plan. Would that be fair to say in your experience? Certainly. I think what so many investors deal with is just human nature is you're always fighting hindsight bias, which is, you know, we're at a point in time now where the S&P 500 looks like the only rational decision if you're comparing its returns to anything else. And you say, well, I should own more of this simply because it's doing well. In maybe a 10-year period of time, that looks pretty favorable. But then, like you said earlier, Paul, if you start zooming out and you don't take such a small view of things, you look at 20 years, 30 years out, it's not as rational. I think the problem, like we always talk about, is 
people get a very short term view. They get influenced heavily by what's happened recently. We're like you say, we're always fighting that last battle, especially from 2009. People are still cautious. Um, and so you look at, you know, just human nature and you say, well, I understand it, but that's the advantage of having a financial plan running in the background with an advisor who can give you this type of advice that you're not constantly fighting the what's hot right now stock pick or the what's hot segment right now. So you're not just drifting aimlessly in the ocean of investments, picking and choosing what happens to be hot rather than what's worked and will work for your financial needs in the future. You know, with, go ahead, Dave. The other thing to think about too is, I guess, fundamentally, I would say past performance doesn't really tell you anything about the future. And I do agree with that. But if anything, investing based on the past 10 years and picking the best performer over the last 10 years or that asset class, if anything, it's going to lead to worse returns going forward because chances are the prices are bid up, uh, values are basically down. And then the, the stuff that's gotten really beat up, you're probably getting, your, your expected returns going forward are probably higher. Well, than, let's think about anything. a real, real life situation. It's the end of 1999 and you have to make a decision about the next 10 years. And at the end of 1999, by that time, Warren Buffett was almost, my words, not his, but you know, a few more years like the late 90s and guys like William Warren Buffett probably would have been run out of business. But because he was value, his returns were somewhere around 75% below what the returns for the 10 year period were for the standard Porsche 500 index. And just about everything else was too. So it's not just poor Warren Buffett, it's just like, it's stuck out. If on December 31st of 1999, you made your decision based on how things have looked over the past 10 years, you would have been 100% standard and force 500 index. Hands down, obvious choice, the winner of the contest is the standard and force 500 index. Over the next 10 years, you would have turned $10,000 into $9,000. And if you would have picked, I can't, I don't remember what Warren Buffett's return were, but if you picked a global portfolio, your $10,000 is now worth somewhere around $17,000. Okay, so now it's the end of 2009, it's December 31st. We have to pick again, which asset class we're gonna pick between the two. And we say, well, I sure like the global a lot better than the Standard & Poor's 500 index. Heck, I lost money for 10 years on the Standard & Poor's 500 index. I'm obviously gonna pick the global portfolio and then over the next 10 years, if, if we ended this decade today, you know, your, your global portfolio probably earned three or four or 5% less per year than the standard and poor 500. And well, it wouldn't be that much, but it's certainly a few percentage point less points less than the standard board. So it would actually be, it, and, and you can't draw anything. You can't draw any conclusions from that because three decades do not make, you know, right. a, 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 an investment policy, nor should they. But it does to, show how poorly that can go. In real time, what a disaster that type of thinking can have. And it doesn't, again, we always have to say, we don't know, there are no facts about the future. So we, we can't speak of that that means anything about the future other than it certainly teaches us some valuable lessons maybe from the uh, past. Uh, look, <clears throat> the good news, if there is any about this, is that uh, passive investment makes things a whole lot easier. If you're actually buying companies, <clears throat> uh, you have to make a decision. Is this company just performing poorly because of a value or whatever, or is it a badly run, run company? And then you have to make all kinds of decisions that you really don't have enough information to make. So being passive actually gets rid of a whole host of uh, a very difficult kind of decision. Takes away a lot of moving parts. So you say, <clears throat> look, I'm underperforming or, or outperforming just based on my asset allocation is different than that particular benchmark. That's a good point. And uh, so this is, this is an interesting times we live in. It really, re it reminds me a lot of the late, 90s other than the, no dot com. it wasn't crazy i'm just talking about the spread between a one asset class standard ports 500 index and just about everything else and the only difference is and maybe it's because my clients have been with me now most of them for their life you know their investment lifetime many of them that they they have they've learned that they saw that play in real time with their money and they saw the benefits of that remaining diversified <laughs> in the face of unbelievable pressure to quit being a diversified investor. Yeah. So there's also kind of an odd uh, issue there that if you really are, um, if you really do have a good benchmark that really uh, characterizes how you're investing, if you beat the uh, benchmark by a long ways or way under it, something's wrong with your. You investment. got the wrong benchmark, right? 
or, or you have the wrong investments. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yes, if that's, especially that holds true a lot of times, even in, in the active management, yeah. even more so it's magnified, but still even in the passive, it's just right. saying, well, wait a minute, you really, you, one of the two isn't constructed properly. Um, I'm going to move on. Now, I got to tell you guys, I was impressed. I, I didn't, I get the notes for the show the day before from son Paul who puts the show together. I guess he produces it in so many words uh, about a, a blog that Daniel wrote after his trip to the Sistine Chapel. I guess that's in Italy. So they tell me Rome probably. <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and of course I told him, this is what you're not supposed to be thinking about work when you're in Italy. <laughs> uh, but it, the Sistine Chapel and the masterpiece of Michelangelo created for uh, Pope Julius II. I wouldn't have known that but now I got a history lesson. And Daniel, I guess it's a really good, in fact, I, it's probably one of my favorite blogs any of us has written. Uh, I'll have to check it for plagiarism. No, <laughs> I can tell it's too personal. It couldn't be. But I was, this is, I was really impressed. And what he wrote as, and I'm just going to kind of synthesize it a little bit, Pope Julius, he's drawn a correlation I'm going to talk about between Pope Julius II saying, look, I have the Sistine Chapel. I want that the ceiling painted. Am I going to do it myself? I have the tools. I could do it. Maybe I even have the knowledge, but there's a lot of room for error here and I may not get it done the way an expert could get it done. So he could either do it on his own. I'm kind of paraphrasing from Daniel's blog, knowing it may fall short of his expectations or he could hire someone to do it. It's very similar to what people facing retirement go through, whether they choose an advisor or not. He eventually chose Michelangelo to create his masterpiece because he knew he would do a spectacular job. After all, he devoted his life to the painting. Uh, safe to say Michelangelo delivered on the Pope's lofty expectations, Daniel, Daniel wrote. Uh, it's a masterpiece the Pope could never have even dream, dreamt of himself. Uh, retirees, Daniel writes, people approach from retirement coming with a vision or a vague idea of what they want retirement to look like, but they have a blank canvas and retirement planners basically do a similar thing. I guess we can all relate to that. I mean, clients come in and they have sort of a vision of, you know, they don't know what their goals are exactly typically, you know, and so that's why we deal with it, what's possible, but they kind of start with this blank canvas in a, in a vision. And as Daniel writes, now they have the tools and they have the money, they have the goals perhaps, they have an idea what the retirement should look like, but they may not have the expertise to make sure all the parts come together perfectly. I'm glad at least at the end of this guy, Daniel wrote, it's kind of arrogant at worst to <laughs> try to compare ourselves to Michael. Well, yeah, I think and the, he's careful to not do that. Yeah, well, the, the good news though is uh, you don't have to choose a Michelangelo financial advisor. You, you want to choose a, a solid, a good, uh, sensible, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, good, sensible advisor. I, know, I mean, if, if someone tells you they're the, Michelangelo of uh, investments. Uh, I'd, I'd run. <laughs> I'd run him to the nut house. Well, I mean, uh, but if you're a customer, you're going to run. Sure, I agree. I'd run out the door with I'd with my hand on my wallet. He writes, "There's no room for sloppy work, carelessness, or inexperience when it comes to retirement planning. That's where we come in. We make sure that they're kind of like a commercial, isn't it? But I I was really impressed by this." Maybe that's because I'm his dad. I don't know. Uh, we make sure that their blank canvas comes to life. I know comparing ourselves to Michelangelo may sound silly at best, arrogant at worst, but if you look at what the very core of what we do, we do similar things. We both create masterpieces. One's artistic and one's financial. Leaving this earth, uh, having done everything you wanted to do, staying financially independent and making the most of the one life you get is the ultimate masterpiece, and I believe we're making it happen for people every day. I admittedly, that probably sounds like a cheap way to slip in a commercial. And it's not really for Rudy Wealth Management. I'm talking about a good, as Fred said, a good, sensible retirement planner has the ability to take that blank canvas of retirement and making it really something truly special. That's just some, I was, people should read the blog. I thought it was really good. I think I'm going to do a commercial. On it. <laughs> I think there's stuff in there to make a radio commercial well, on WDWS. And the thing I got out of it is look, there's just a lot of different pieces to, putting together a retirement plan. And I think a lot of times people just don't have the ability to piece everything together on their own. And so sometimes hiring someone to just help you kind of figure everything out and put all the pieces together into one cohesive plan can be really valuable. I think it does. And I think what, even probably on the front end of my career, I underestimated is how that value increases as the clients uh, age year by year. 
um, because people change, obviously. Um, I always say, you know, my clients in their mid seventies, um, they don't worry about things they used to worry about when they were 60 and they worry about things now that they didn't worry about when they were 60. Just our life changes. Our cognitive abilities become, get a little worn down other than Fred. Fred's go up, <laughs> mine probably go down. Um, and, and so I think, I think many times people on the front end of a relationship with a retirement planner are probably paying it forward. They're paying it forward uh, so that when these curveballs come to them, and they hit everybody. I mean, nobody, anybody tells you they haven't had any curveballs their whole life. Well, we would, they would also say they were Michelangelo, <laughs> right? Um, there's curveballs that need to be ironed out. And the more time that goes by and the more trust in that relationship that's developed, the more confident the client becomes, they're more apt to take the advice just because it is the advisor's advice. And then the other thing I think for a lot of people, I don't know what you guys think about this, but I think in the back of a lot, and I've talked to a number of them that tell me this is true in the back of their minds. Many times one spouse is the real financial person and the other spouse is a little more passive about the financial side. They're doing other parts of their life and making it, I call it ham and nagging it and making it work together. The kids make fun of me, Fred, when I say ham and nagging it, everybody who's 60 and above and the adult memory knows what that means. And it's really nice to know, that you have an advisor in place. So if something happens to the spouse that's dominant on the financial side, that the other spouse that may is naturally vulnerable at that time, not just financially vulnerable, just vulnerable, that they have somebody in place ahead of time that you can trust, knowing if I wake up on a cloud that this person's going to do right by my spouse, male or female. Uh, and, and, and that's, probably just getting too syrupy for the radio. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> Let's go on to some harder hitting stuff. Anyway, I think I would encourage anybody entering retirement in summary, this isn't an advertising for Rudy Wealth Management. Pick the advisor of your, just make sure you pick a good one because if you pick the right one, you'll well, it'll make a big difference in your life. If you choose the wrong one, it'll make a big difference in your life. So you have to be careful. So let's, that's kind of a good segue guy into, okay, we talk about retirement planning, but what really are the components of that retirement plan? And it's a major milestone for most people's lives. Uh, they've used worked 30 to 40 years. Now they're looking at at least 20, but probably 30 years for the typical couple of retirement. It's exciting, but yet at the same time, you guys see the stress that walks in the office for the prospective client that's thinking about retirement. Um, so it kind of ends up begging the uh, question, what should be included in a retirement plan? So David, the first one you wrote about, I guess you did a blog on this. Sorry, I should have announced that. It's not that I don't like you as much as Daniel. I just, you know, Daniel's blog, you know, Michelangelo. Mine was, mine was boring compared to his. <laughs> well, they were just different. And that's what, you know, what's nice is we pro try to provide content from different personalities, from different right. views of life. And I think people enjoy that. Um, when will you retire is kind of the big one. And I kind of, that's almost kind of like, can I retire? Right. Um, so that's I, kind of the most important, that's usually where the big one people want to know. Yeah. And that's why I started with it. Cause I do think it's one of the most impactful decisions you make when it comes to a retirement plan. Um, Cause really when you think about it, there are trade offs. So first of all, like you said, a lot of people want to know, well, can I retire? So there's going to be a certain age where like if you need a certain level of income, this is the earliest you can retire unless you make adjustments elsewhere like saving more or whatever. But then beyond that, sometimes people have flexibility. So they're not necessarily just going to retire at the absolute earliest possible age. And they want to know, well, what's, what are the trade-offs involved with working longer or retiring sooner? And it does have a big impact because the longer you work, the more years you have saving money, the more years you have the money that you've already saved growing, and you also are reducing the number of years that you have to withdraw from your portfolio. So you're going to be able to spend more when you do retire, but you also pushed out retirement. So you're giving up a couple of years of your, not giving up a couple well, you're, of years of your well, life, but it, you're working an extra couple of years. The way I explain it to people is we price decisions. In other words, right. well, what if I work two years longer? Well, let's price it. And when I say what, when I'm, what I mean by that is what, What's the, what's the scenario look like if you work two more years versus the you know working two fewer years, and you're going to see wow okay so I can spend an extra two hundred dollars a month. In other words, we price it so they go oh now I for the first time can understand 
what the benefits there are and what the costs are. We know what the costs are. I'm going to work two more years. What are the benefits? And you price them. Exactly. And then the other thing I added to this section as well is it's important to remember that retirement isn't necessarily an all or nothing decision. You could go work a different job that you enjoy more. You could work part time at your current job if they allow it or part time at a different job. And a lot of times that can allow you like, for people who really don't care for their current job, but they're not quite ready to fully retire financially. They can't quite, they're not, not quite there. That can be the, the solution. Um, so I just think it's an important thing for people to consider. Okay. The other one I said is kind of the, maybe the tide for first is uh, how much can you spend? Right. And then I think your plan for each retirement age, and this goes hand in hand with you talking about what are the costs and the benefits of retiring sooner or later. Really the key thing people want to know is how much can I spend if I retire at X age? So how much can I spend each year in retirement from that point forward and not have to worry about running out of money? And a big component of retirement spending may be coming from the investment portfolio. So Ryan, you know, with the next question Dave put in there is, so how are we going to invest this money? And right. how, how is that? Tell me, you know, how that works. Right. So that's easily one of the biggest levers that can have a significant impact on when you can retire, how much you can spend during retirement is the amount you invest in stocks versus bonds. And most folks are probably aware stocks are a lot more volatile or risky uh, depending on your terminology, we use fluctuate dollars, more. They fluctuate more um, relative to bonds, which are a little more stable by comparison. Um, but that is going to drive a lot of your options down the road by how much you have invested in stocks versus bonds. If you're too heavily in bonds, you're you're going to have a lot less fluctuation. But chances are you may not be able to keep up with inflation, so your purchasing power in in maybe 10, 20 years is significantly declined, which is why there is a generally a need for a lot of retirees to keep a good portion of their investments in an asset class like stocks that do fluctuate more than a bond does. Uh, so that's the, the big decision. And that's decision. just because they need the premium returns that have historically uh, been generated by ownership of the great companies of the world as opposed to just buying bonds. Right. If, if we could get the, uh, the stability of bonds with the purchasing power of, of that stocks deliver over the long term, everyone would do that, but it simply doesn't exist. Well, everybody would do that, and then, of course, they'd get to end up with the returns of bonds. Exactly. So, it's well. a vicious cycle that you can't break free from. So you have to give somewhere. And so for most folks, you fall on the line of having to have some portion of your assets in retirement invested in the stock market or in some form of individual stocks, mutual funds, or exchange-traded funds. The decision is just a matter of how much. So, and that kind of is that tied in with uh, how much we're going to be withdrawing from the portfolio for that um, the income that we're going to be spending? Yeah, it'll be how much you need to withdraw, when you need to make those withdrawals. Uh, if you maybe potentially are retiring early, so you don't have Social Security or a other form of uh, fixed income coming in like a pension, you may need to have a heavier lien on your assets that you've saved up for retirement. So you need to make sure that the time frame of when you need this money is also properly aligned with the allocation, the stocks versus bonds decision. So there's a lot that goes into it. And I think that's probably one of the things that people struggle with the most when trying to do their own retirement planning is figuring out how much am I going to withdraw from my investment portfolio because everyone's terrified that they're going to run out of money. And most people just don't really know what they need to know or don't know all the research that's out there around sustainable withdrawal rates um, and kind of how you can increase your sustainable withdrawal rate or if you want to be conservative, kind of what a reasonable amount is. And so I think that's really where an advisor can come into play is, okay, we can tell you, here's how much we're confident you can withdraw from your portfolio and not have to worry about running out. And then monitoring that withdrawal rate over time, depending on investment performance, you may need to adjust it. Yeah. Right. And that, go ahead. I was going to say that to me, that's one of the biggest unknowns for someone who is a do-it-yourself investor during your retirement years is, am I spending the right amount? Am I spending too much or am I withholding too much? So if I withhold and I'm not spending enough, I'm sacrificing the one retirement that I get. On the other side, it's just as evil as if, if you're spending too much, you're very likely going to run out on the, on the outside of retirement or on the later years of retirement. So it's a very important decision and a very important part that really needs to be looked at closely. And for most folks, what is the, what is the proxy to determine if you're doing it right? 
And I think outside of having maybe a, a financial planner or an advisor or some sort of a software to monitor this, you might be flying blind. Um, some research has come out, like I know we've talked about Bill Bangin's 4% rule, uh, where you can potentially withdraw 4% a year and, uh, as long as you have a certain criteria met. The problem with blindly following that rule is it may not be the way you're actually invested in stocks versus bonds. And so you have to make sure that you don't follow rules of thumb just blindly and assume that it'll work out for you. That's why having an outside source to at least give a look over the shoulder uh, can be so important. And of course, any part of a good retirement plan, just about every decision has some tax implications, David. And so how, why don't you explain to people what part taxation or trying to minimize taxation all through retirement plays in a retirement plan? Yeah, I mean, it's common sense. So the more you can minimize taxes, the more you get to actually spend on yourself. Or if you don't want to spend it on yourself, you can give it away or whatever. Um, but most people generally like the idea of minimizing the taxes that they're paying throughout retirement. Now, fortunately, there are some easy ways that you can do this. First and foremost is just using tax efficient investments. I think people people don't always give that enough credit because if you have a big taxable account and you're using you know, actively managed mutual funds that are trading all the time, they're going to kick out a lot of capital gains and also a decent amount of short-term capital gains. They can be pretty tax inefficient. So that's the easy one that you can get right off the bat just by using tax efficient index funds and ETFs. Um, but then there are other things like, well, let's make sure we withdraw from our accounts in the right order. And a common example is for retirees who are um, in the early phases of retirement, and maybe they haven't claimed social security yet. Sometimes if you're withdrawing from a taxable brokerage account, you can be in a really low tax bracket, even a 0% tax bracket. So you can do things like harvest capital gains at 0%. You can do things like convert money from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA while you're in this low tax bracket to avoid a, high, a higher tax bracket down the road. Um, so those are some easy ones. And then other things like just if you're giving money to charity, make sure you do that in a tax efficient way using things like donor advised funds to concentrate into one year to make sure that you actually get to take a deduction for that or doing qualified charitable distributions from your IRA if you're over 70 and a half. So there are all these things that you can do and the exact strategies that apply to you and are available. It's going to be different from person to person, but the key is to to do everything you can to keep as much money as possible in your pocket. Because the only money you get to spend is what you get to spend after inflation and after taxes. Um, the next one getting less common, that's a you know, less common decision that has to be made because fewer people have pensions any, you know, these days. But still, there's a lot of people that have them. And one of the questions, there's actually a couple of questions, is a lot of times it's if you have the option to take a lump sum versus do I take the pension payment, that's one. And the second is, all right, if I'm going to take this pension payment, now I have to figure out what uh, which benefit option I choose. Do I do 100% survivor, 75, 50, et cetera? Right. And that comes down to just modeling the different options and seeing what uh, ends up working the best for your life. And, and some of it's psychological. Some people have a really strong psychological preference for that guaranteed pension income. And other people hate that guaranteed pension income because they know it's going to go away and they're not going to have that money left over for their children versus if they took a lump sum, uh, there's a high likelihood they're going to be able to leave some of that to their uh, heirs whenever they pass away. So there are multiple factors to consider. And I did write a, an article about this on our website if people want to get into more detail. Just on specific that. to pension decisions. Yep. Okay. Um, We've, coupled some, we've covered some of the income sources, but what about Social Security? For a lot of people, that's the biggest or close to the biggest income stream that they're going to have in retirement. When, is, when do you claim Social Security was the next question or the next thing you should be having a retirement plan? Yeah, and I don't think typically this is like a total game changer for financial plans, so I don't want to make it seem excessively important, but it does have an impact. And you can claim anywhere between the age of 62 and 70. And if you delay, your benefit's going to be higher, but you're also foregoing getting benefits in the years that you delayed. Um, so there's cost-benefit analysis to be done there. And then also, I really like to just look at it in the context of an overall plan and say, how does it impact my retirement spending? How does it impact my legacy value? And then there are psychological and practical issues of, well, if I delay Social Security, Am I able to fund my lifestyle in the meantime with portfolio withdrawals? And am I comfortable 
taking extra high portfolio withdrawals in the meantime to allow me to delay social security. But as a rule, we tend to favor delaying if that, you know, if it can, you know, if, if people can tolerate it. And if, you know, if we, if we could mandate it, we probably would have people delay somewhat, at least to some point, right? Yeah, I think so. And there's not a one size fits all. But explain um, the benefits. You you do it eloquently of kind of the main benefits of delaying just beyond a higher return. Right. Well, I think of the benefits of delaying is one, you're getting more income that is completely uh, hedged to inflation. So your social security income is going to increase if inflation increases. Um, it extends for the rest of your life, no matter how long you live. So it hedges against longevity risk. And then it's basically this guaranteed increase in benefits that isn't dependent on market returns. So it kind of hedges against really poor market returns because you're going to be relying on your investment portfolio less and getting more from Social Security. So those are the three things. Three of the biggest risks for retirees are high inflation, living a really long time, and poor investment returns. And delaying Social Security kind of hedges all three of those things. So that's why typically when I look at a plan and we get a, a measure called probability of success, usually that probability of success is a little bit higher if people have at least one of the spouses delay social security. And another big one, Ryan, uh, particularly for people that retire before age 65 when they're eligible for Medicare is healthcare costs. How are we gonna fund those? If I'm a 60 year old and I'm looking at five more years of private funding, that's a big one. Certainly. And this oftentimes is the decision for a lot of folks on why they cannot retire before age 65 is because the cost of insuring through the open marketplace or otherwise is so expensive that it's just simply not even an option. Because if you can live on $50,000 a year and you have to pay maybe $1,000 a month in a premium for this private insurance, you're easily spe uh, spending 12000 to another upwards of fifteen or 16000 with co-pays, out-of-pockets, et cetera. And that, that is a gigantic amount of your total spending money that is now just consumed entirely by healthcare. So for anyone who does consider an early retirement, you absolutely must ensure that you're considering your healthcare costs as part of that. Um, and so you have the options of looking at the marketplace, the, the healthcare marketplace, and if you can control your income, that gives you a really good option because you can get a subsidy for the lower healthcare cost. And I'm gonna kind of skip one of the, oh, go ahead, Fred. Well, I did my homework this week. Last time we All talked right, about uh, 65 and still working <clears throat> and do you do Medicare or not? And the answer, I, I think the answer is, again, no one should rely just on me, but uh, if you're still working, you don't have to do it unless you're with an employer less than 20 uh, employees. Uh, and, but you can do Part A and it's free. And the only downside of Part A is you can't have a health care savings account. So. Uh, okay. Well, then, thanks for clearing that up. I'm just fine. We always promise we're going to come back and answer the question. <laughs> yep. Fred does it. Uh, we kind of covered long term care expenses quite a bit in the last couple of shows. But here's kind of a big one, and then we'll kind of stop there and we'll just chat for a minute. But will my spouse be okay? if I die and vice versa. David, I mean, you're flushing that out in every plan, aren't you? Yeah, it's something that I think a lot of people ignore too because even for a common scenario where people just have, each spouse has social security benefits and then they're combining that with portfolio income for their total income, well, when one of the spouses dies, the surviving spouse is just gonna get the higher benefit of the two. In other words, the smaller one's gonna drop off. So, so just that right there, I mean, you're going to have a, a reduction in income and you need to make sure that, and it can be even bigger if you have pension income streams, a bigger impact if you have pension income streams that don't have 100% survivor benefit. So you need to look at that and say, okay, if this happens, how much will the surviving spouse be able to spend and will the surviving spouse be okay on that level of income? Well, the stakes are high when you're going into retirement for planning. You know, sometimes we think of it as just an investment issue, but when you really think... Yeah, I don't know if it'd be an exaggeration to say in some ways it's hyper complex issue because so many of these things, it's like a matrix. If you do one thing, then it impacts another and that impacts another. Uh, so you, it's really beneficial to hire a fee only financial advisor to guide you is my, is my advice. Doesn't have to be us. Pick the one of your choosing. But again, the stakes are high when you transfer transition into retirement.